There are three things you need to be able to do in chronic kidney disease. The first is stage someone and recognize when dialysis is going to be necessary. The second is going to learn how to prevent progression of chronic kidney disease. The third is managing complications. Chronic kidney disease means a decreased glomerular filtration rate. How we, the providers, actually determine that's happening is by measuring the creatinine. And there's a couple of equations you can look at, but you don't have to memorize or even know the name of, that estimate the glomerular filtration rate based on the creatinine. That presumes the creatinine is stable. It is very unreliable to use the creatinine to assess the GFR during acute kidney injury because the creatinine is changing. In chronic kidney disease, it is safe to assume that whatever the equation tells you is the GFR based on the creatinine is legitimate. And so we use the GFR to determine the stage of chronic kidney disease. And that's what I want to start off with. There are five stages. With the fifth stage being less than 15 and essentially in stage renal disease. These patients are essentially anuric for all intents and purposes. Normal GFR is greater than 90, and that means CKD stage one. So if they have a normal GFR and any evidence of CKD, then they've got stage one. And the action here is to prevent progression. And you're always going to want to prevent progression. This never changes. So for every stage, prevent progression. Stage two, has a GFR of 60 to 89. And stage two is really no different than stage one, except the GFR is reduced. You don't really start seeing the complications of chronic kidney disease until you get into stage three. Stage three and four is really where you start to see these. Stage three being 30 to 59, and stage four, 15 to 29. This is where you begin to see complications. In their management. At CKD4, the progression to end-stage renal disease is essentially inevitable. You are going to try to prevent progression and manage the complications, but at CKD4, you need to prepare for, for dialysis. Because at CKD stage 5, you must have dialysis. When I say prepare HD, what I mean is if the person is going to have hemodialysis, they're going to have to have an AV fistula. That gets put in today and matures over the period of months. You can't use an AV fistula right away. So if you know they're going to progress to CKD5, you might as well put in the fistula at CKD4, getting them ready for dialysis. There are two different types of dialysis. There's hemodialysis. and peritoneal. Hemodialysis is the thing you need a fistula, a graft, or a vas cath for, and it happens three times a week, generally for four hours at a time. Peritoneal dialysis happens nightly while the patient's asleep, requires a peritoneal catheter, and generally lasts six to eight hours. Which one you pick is not relevant. Peritoneal is technically cheaper, but if they're at this point, they need one or the other, and patients generally try one and they switch back and forth. Just know that there are two, both hemodialysis and peritoneal. And once the person hits CKD stage five, they're going to need dialysis. So beyond that, we want to prevent pr progression and manage complications. So preventing progression comes down to three things. Hypertension, diabetes, and proteinuria. In hypertension management, as you learned in the cardiology videos, JNC8 has been very lenient with the blood pressure goals. What you should learn for CKD is that more aggressive blood pressure control does better than lenient. The goal in CKD is less than 130 over less than 80. And you achieve this with ACE inhibitors, 
or angiotensin receptor blockers. There used to be this combination of the two to prevent proteinuria, don't do it. Pick either an ACE or an ARB and your blood pressure management, trying to get a goal of 130 over 80. Diabetes is easy because the management of diabetes in CKD is no different than the management of diabetes in general. Your goal is to have an A1C less than 7, generally a blood glucose of 80 to 120. And you can do that with any oral medications other than metformin, and ultimately you can use insulin. Metformin causes a lactic acidosis in kidney disease. That one you shouldn't use. But if the person is on insulin, and this you have to be careful about this, if the person is on insulin or a sulfonylurea and they have chronic kidney disease, insulin is cleared by the kidneys. And so having these patients on these medications puts them at risk for hypoglycemia, especially if their CKD worsens and the clearance of insulin goes down. Proteinuria is basically covered by the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Just the fact they have proteinuria means their disease is going to progress, and if you can manage to reduce proteinuria by being on an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin receptor blocker, or a diet low in protein, they actually improve. Complication management, though, is where we're going to spend most of our time because there's a number of complications that come up, and you have to know how to handle them. The first one is anemia. Anemia of chronic kidney disease happens like this. Kidneys make EPO. As the kidneys crap out, there's very little EPO. So there's nothing to tell the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. The patient is generally going to present asymptomatic. You screen them, and their hemoglobin is less than 12 when you start investigating. Anemia of chronic kidney disease is a diagnosis of exclusion. You want to rule out the other causes of normocytic anemia and check for iron, folate, B12. Rule out all the causes of anemia, especially nutritional deficiencies, before you label it anemia of chronic kidney disease. Once you have anemia of chronic kidney disease, you're going to treat it with iron supplementation, sometimes intravenous, given with dialysis, you give them EPO, and every once in a while, they may need transfusions. The goal is a hemoglobin greater than 10. Now also notice what's not up here. EPO is not a diagnostic step. Don't be fooled. If they've got chronic kidney disease, and you've ruled out nutritional deficiencies, and they have a normocytic anemia, it's anemia of chronic kidney disease, treat them with iron, EPO, and transfusions as needed. Two complications sort of go hand in hand, and that is going to be secondary hyperparathyroidism and mineral bone disease. An elevated phosphorus and a low calcium both stimulate parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone goes to the bone and resorbs bone. This is far more complicated than I want to get into now, and we'll talk more about it in the calcium lecture. Suffice to say, phosphorus is stimulating parathyroid hormone in an attempt to eliminate phosphorus through the kidney. But because the kidneys are dying, that doesn't happen, and phosphorus accumulates. The calcium is low because parathyroid hormone cannot stimulate 125 vitamin D, which absorbs calcium from the gut. So parathyroid hormone goes up in an attempt to increase calcium. The problem is, that parathyroid hormone absorbs calcium and phosphorus from the bone, but because phosphorus can't be excreted, the phosphorus continues to rise. So, too much phosphorus, too little calcium, too much parathyroid hormone. The patient is going to present asymptomatic. If the calcium phos product is greater than 55, they're at risk for calciphylaxis ulcerations of the skin, but generally that doesn't happen because we're checking BMPs. The diagnosis is made simply by checking labs. 
a calcium and a phosphorus. And the treatment, why I spent so much time on that, the treatment is going to be based on the original pathology. If you give phosphate binders, like Savellamer, you reduce the phosphorus level, reducing the stimulation of PTH. If you give calcimimetics, like sinicalcid, these act as calcium and reduce parathyroid hormone excretion. The idea is you turn off parathyroid hormone so that you don't get bone resor resorption. And because they don't make vitamin D the way they're supposed to, you simply replace calcium and vitamin D. If you don't do this, they're going to get mineral bone disease, which is essentially osteopenia, or they get pathological fractures. So you do this to prevent the product of too much parathyroid hormone, which is tertiary hyperparathyroidism and mineral bone disorder. That one was tough. Two ones we end on is, are simpler. It's volume overload and metabolic acidosis. Volume overload. You don't pee off the fluid you drink, you retain fluid. The way you manage this is with loop diuretics like furosemide, and you may add on thiazide diuretics. It will not be rare to see a person on CKD stage four who still has some urinary output to be on a combination of furosemide and metolazone. What they're doing is trying to maintain the urinary output to the bitter end, trying to delay the onset of hemodialysis. Remember, prepare them for dialysis by putting in that AV fistula. And lastly, metabolic acidosis. The bicarb usually settles out between somewhere between 10 and 20. And if they have that, you don't want them to be acidotic, you give them sodium bicarb orally to balance out their bicarb. Okay, stage it based on the GFR. Types of dialysis, blood pressure goal, more stringent than usual, use ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Diabetes, get it to 80 to 120 using orals or insulin. Avoid metformin. Anemia, EPO, phosphate binders, calcium medics, calcium and vitamin D. And then every once in a while, you'll be using sodium bicarb to manage the metabolic acidosis or loop diuretics to manage volume overload. That, chronic kidney disease.